joints in the mat. Missed you folks, only been away for about maybe 10 days, I think. But first of all, I'd like to give uh, thanks to uh, Pastor Rick Batez. He did a great job. And also to Cliff Spear for filling in. In fact, uh, Rick did so good, I was ready to come here Friday. And uh, he wanted to, he asked me some questions about the sins of the tongue and how they relate to the subject of bitterness. So I said, do you want to do it? He goes, yeah, I'll do it to finish out the week. And then Saturday, I studied all day. Oh, man, I was all pumped up Saturday. I couldn't be, wait to be here on Sunday. Sunday morning, I wake up at 5.30. Look outside, I can't even see my car. <laughs> I can't see the road, I can't see absolutely nothing. So he said, well, I guess we're not gonna have service. I have to wait till Wednesday. But sometimes you need that little break, that little rest, and uh, some things were a rest for me, some things were not. But thank God for his power. We are going to take uh, an offering this evening because as you know, the bank still charges us for uh, the building even if we cancel service. We can't call them up and say don't charge us this week uh, because we cancel service. We still have to pay our utilities and uh, all the other things that normal churches have to pay. But uh, before we do that, I want to uh, pray for, hold on for a second please. Before we do that, I want to pray for Nada Kabrick, Rick's wife. She is in the hospital with some major serious health problems. And uh, I want you to keep her in, in prayer because we're not even sure that she'll be coming back home. So uh, keep her in prayer, keep Rick in prayer and the family, and uh, do what, we'll do what we can to put that wall of fire around the family so that God will give them the ability to have the power, the courage, the grace to go through whatever it is that he sees fit and that he desires for them to go through. So pray for Nada, Nada K. Brick, in your prayers. This is a time now where you can worship God in the realm of giving. There's a principle taught in the Old Testament called standing in the gap. Now is the time to do so. You see, a lot of times people have to learn the principle that when other people are not, will not do or are not able to do what they normally do, sometimes you need people to stand in the gap and do a little bit more. So this is your opportunity to do so if you desire as we enter into the Word of God this evening. So before we do that, let us pray. Father, thank you for the privilege and the opportunity that we have to be members of your royal family to grow in your grace and in your knowledge and realize all it is that you have done for us. And Father, we do ask that once again, you just pr we pray for the entire Kbrick family that you would touch them as we go forward in this plan. And Father, we also ask that this evening you would touch those who are able to give beyond what they normally give to stand in the gap so that we may continue to go forward in your plan and not be in bondage in any realm of finances. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our precious Lord and Savior, we do pray, amen. And the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. It's a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. 
All scripture is God breathed that is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man and woman of God may become mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turn in the word of truth this evening to Revelation chapter 13. Maria, is your family still coming up this weekend? Robert, we will be having a special Lord's Supper for everyone this Sunday coming up, okay? Uh, her family comes from Florida, and uh, when people travel like that, a lot of times they don't have a chance for face-to-face -face, uh, supper, so they, what, what does it matter anyway, right? It's just another celebration of our Lord and what he's done for our lives. And uh, I thank God that we're, going, we're here to celebrate because God only knows what's going to happen in this upcoming year. I have been working on something kind of different for you. Uh, I, don't, I'm not, I'm, I do not know if it's going to be ready by Sunday, but I've been dealing with the predictions for 2017. I didn't say prophecies, I said predictions. And I say that because I listened to last year's tape and some of the things that I predicted would happen for 2016. If you get a chance, go back and listen to it. It's amazing. Some of the, some of the, uh, uh, some of the predictions were right on target. For example, I said, watch Saudi Arabia and Turkey. And this past year, Saudi, in, in, Saudi Arabia and Turkey have been major, major uh, issues and major, major pro players in what's going on in the world. And we have some exciting times coming up, as you know, what's going on in our country with the new administration. And uh, I've been dealing with that with God, studying and also praying that he would guide me for any of my personal predictions, if you care. It doesn't matter if you, uh, you don't have to believe them. It's just what I believe or I'm going to predict what I think will happen. But before we do that and before we study that, we're going to continue our study in the, the dispensation of the law. And therefore, we have to take our moment of silent prayer to give ourselves the opportunity to do what the Apostle Paul said. For the Apostle Paul made this statement. He talked about us becoming, in reference to your former manner of life, lay aside your old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now here's the key. Put on the new self. Put on the new self, and which, which has been created in the likeness of God and, ha and based upon holiness or devotion to the truth. So what is our moment of silent prayer about? It's a time when we can examine our own lives, name and cite any known sins, be filled with the Spirit, for the Bible does say if we confess our sins, he is what? He's faithful. Not only that, but he's just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all of our righteousness, from all our unrighteousness. Now remember, all sins were paid for on the cross. That's called positional forgiveness. But we also have experiential forgiveness where if we commit an act against God, we have to have an attitude where we name and cite it to him so that we can experience that forgiveness. It's just like if we sin against one another. If we keep on sinning against one another and then don't make up for what we have done, or don't become accountable for what we've done. What kind of life are we going to have? So it says that's positional, saint, uh, right, uh, positional forgiveness took place at the cross. He died for our sins once and for all. Experiential forgiveness is something that we do on a habitual day-by-day -day basis. Therefore, with that in mind, let us pray. Once again, Father, thank you that we have the privilege to be together once again. We know that life goes on one day at a time for every single one of us. Let us never take this subject that we're studying in the dispensation now of the law, dealing with the principles that we're about to see this evening. Let us never take the word of God for granted. Let us continue to grow in your grace and in your knowledge as we fulfill your plan for our life. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, once again, we have spent enough time, I believe, concerning the Jews and how they failed at that second water test at Marah. What does Marah mean? 
It means, it means bitterness. When they failed, because they failed because they became emotional. They did not see things in the mental realm. They saw things based upon how they, the, how they felt. And what happened to them, it resulted in them becoming in bondage. But not only that, even worse, they began to develop garbage in their soul. And so because of the manifestation of bitterness, they still have not grown up spiritually in spite of all the signs all the signs and the miracles that they saw in Egypt. Remember what our Lord said in Matthew 12, 39? Who seeks for signs and wonders? He said, an evil and adulterous. Adulterous means you are committing sin. You are becoming an adulteress against God. You're, you're becoming apostate. You're turning your back upon him. And it says, an evil and adulterous generation craves or seeks for a sign. Now, I want you to see that in the last days, look at Revelation 13, 13. In the last days, Satan is going to use signs, wonders, and miracles to deceive the inhabitants of the world. Again, notice what I said. In the last days, he's going to use. Who's going to do it? Satan. Can Satan perform signs? Absolutely. Can Satan perform wonders? Absolutely. And in the last days, he will use signs and wonders to deceive the inhabitants of the world. Look at what verse 13 says. And he, it's a reference to the beast here and the false prophet all working together. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And then look at verse 14. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for signs. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him. God gave him the, the ability to do so, by the way, to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword. That's the false Christ saying, I, I'm the one who really got wounded and has now come to life. You see, it's so easy. I called a, I was thinking about it today. I wanted to give him a little title about what he is. I call Satan an Eminem. He's a master magician. He knows how to perform magic. Have you ever been to a magic show? If you've ever been to a magic show and, and seen a magician who's really good, it's unbelievable some of the things that you can do with trickery. Now think about it. If a member of the human race who has a low IQ compared to Satan can do so, think of how powerful he's going to manifest his power as a master magician. The magicians in our day and age can trick an audience very, very easy. Whether the, Even if it's live, they can do so. And so there have been many times that Satan has had an easy time revealing his supernatural power. For example, I think we studied this once before when we looked at the doctrine of miracles. If an unbeliever opens up his life, opens up his heart to have uh, the demons come into him because he wants to serve Satan or he believes in Satan, he's involved in the occult, and if he does so, the demon has the right to go inside of the individual's body because the individual has asked for it. So with the, when the un unbeliever, with his own free will, makes a decision and says, okay, I want Satan to come into me. Give me the power. So Satan sends one of his demons inside of that person, and the person goes around performing all demonic activity, and the next thing you know, uh, this person now goes to some false teaching that's called Christian teaching in some tent meeting, and then the, the person stands up. He's, uh, he's, he's foaming at the mouth. He's screaming and hollering. He's really possessed now. Then Satan goes, demon, leave. The demon and leaves and the man is healed. What, what is that? That's just a false healing. That's because Satan has set it up so that people will say, wow, who's this man on the pulpit, that miracle worker who just performed a miracle? Let's follow his teaching. After all, he's got a lot of power. He just healed that man. He just actually helped that man be healed from demon possession. So my whole point is simply this. Signs and wonders never really accomplish anything. They don't accomplish what we have been created for. What have we been created for? That should be Revelation 4.11. We've been created to give what? Glory to who? Glory to God. Not glory to ourselves, but glory to our God. So they had adult bodies, these individuals in the Jewish realm, but spiritually, they have never grown up. They were shallow. 
They were superficial. They were totally dependent on entertainment. They wanted more signs. They were dependent on signs. They were dependent on wonders, although the signs and wonders that they saw, such as the ten plagues, accomplished absolutely nothing. So they, there were springs of water, therefore they now come to Marah. Go to Exodus chapter 15, where we continue with really the beginning of the dispensation of the Lord. It really begins here. Though we can, you know, give it a time when Moses was born, etc. But what happened? They, they now come to the waters of Marah, the waters of bitterness. They could not drink the waters of Marah. Why? There were springs all over the place where God, where God had led them, where God had led Moses to lead them. But they could not drink the waters of Marah. Why? Because the waters of Marah were bitter. And that's why they called it Marah. And as we have noted, they flunked the too much water test at the Red Sea. They lived in fear of the water. Now they're going to flunk the wrong kind of water test, where they had plenty of water, but is it was the wrong kind, or was it, as we will see this evening. Notice where we are in the beginning, really the beginning of the dispensation of the Lord. After they crossed the Red Sea, now God's going to speak to Moses and give him the Ten Commandments. Verse 22. Exodus 15, 22. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. Okay? We know where the Egyptians are. They're under the Red Sea. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the desert of Shur. They went three days in the desert, and they found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses, once again, who's getting blamed, the man that just led them out of the Red Sea, the man that just led them away from Egypt and the Egyptians, they grumbled, the people grumbled at Moses saying, what are we going to drink? What shall we drink? I want you to notice what Moses did after the Jews, actually the children of Israel failed, they complained in their bitterness. Notice verse 25. Then Moses, what did he do? Cried out. Cried out to who? To the Lord. What did he do? Cried out to the Lord. And by the way, the verb cry in the Hebrew is, is the Hebrew verb tasak, which means that Moses interceded. It doesn't mean he was crying to God. It means he actually had a loud voice to God. He's interceding, interceding and he offered a prayer to the Lord. And he, he cried out and prayed for the very ones that had just attacked him, for the, the very ones that are causing uh, all kinds of division in their particular location, in their particular tribe, he prayed for them. He did not become bitter. That's why our Lord said, pray for your enemies. At this time, Moses' enemies are his own congregation. And so this is why, well, this is what we call, again, Moses now comes on the scene. He goes, these people are freaking out, God. What do I do? This is what we call, what I said uh, before the offering, standing in the gap. That's what Moses did, interceding for others by picking up the shield of faith in prayer. He picked up the shield of faith in prayer while he was under pressure. And this is what Amaraz, by the way, notice what I'm about to say. It's a very interesting point. God gave me this about two nights ago. This is what Amaraz or our bitter situations are designed to do. Why is it that we have to go through bitter situations? Well, notice, this is what our maraz or our bitter situations are designed to do, which is to drive us to the Lord. Like Deuteronomy 23, 5 says, what can happen? The curse can turn into a blessing. Sometimes the worst experiences that we go through are the best experiences that we've ever had because they drive us to the Lord. They cause us to become more dependent upon him. They cause us to know how real he is. So it's very important because if you understand this principle, then you'll understand why we go through certain things. And uh, notice I said these things are caused to drive us to the Lord. Lord. You see, I want you to get this picture now. In the natural realm, as in the natural realm, so in the spiritual. Bitter pills may have blessed effects. 
Bitter pills may have blessed effects. For example, sometimes you'd have to take a medicine, and the last thing you want to do, there's certain medicines I have to take. I, I don't even want to take it because it causes me to want to vomit. But, some, but it's the best thing for me. Sometimes some of the things that you take in the medical realm, in the natural realm, they don't taste good, they don't feel good. They have a bad effect upon us, but they have tremendous, tremendous uh, results. And therefore, never allow, this is what happens to people because you're gonna see this in 2017, the spiritual yo-yos will be back, up and down, up and down, January, February, March, April, May, up and down, in, out, in, out, in, and out. Why? Because they don't know how to handle the bitter situations of life and have that cause them to go forward with God. And so they, we must take time sometimes. We must, we must take the bitter with the sweet. You're going to have bitter times in your life. Everyone does. And you're going to have sweet times. But don't allow yourself to become filled with bitterness. I want you to look at it like this. And I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Rod Hadjik from down in Texas because I asked him, I was dealing with some principles, and I had to call him up to say, ask him if it was true in the spiritual, in the uh, natural realm. And he wrote me back, uh, I think it was this morning, and he said, absolutely, it is really, really good. What one of my talking about. There are times when you need to get a certain prescribed medical shot to protect you from a virus that is going around. You see, if a virus is going around, you might be called to get a, a certain type of medical, you know, med medical shot to help you go through. Do you know what's inside of that medical shot? The virus. The very virus that's around, they actually inject in you. Why? They, it want, they want your body to be trained in the immune system on how to handle the virus that is going on. It usually, more than likely, contains the virus that is out, by the way, not to, de to destroy your body, but God says, I want to give you a shot so that your body can be trained on how to deal with these things and how to deal with what's going on in the virus. You see, the, bi the, the, bob the body is a magnificent vessel. It's a manifestation. If you look at your body, your body is a manifestation of the omniscience, the knowledge, or the omnipotence, the power of God. The body is a fantastic thing. I think it was uh, Beth DeStefano that told me one of the things that caused her to become a nurse is that she was just blown away by the body. Because if you understand what's going on inside of your body, I mean, you, can't, you cannot believe the things that go on. You watch all these medical shows out today, you can learn a lot about what takes place in the body because the body is a magnificent vessel because it was created by a magnificent God. If you don't believe me, go back to Psalm, or go to Psalm 139. The body, the body, the body, the body actually is a fantastic thing when you understand that God made it according to knowledge, and he made it according to his power. And I like how David put it, Psalm 139, verse 13. He says this, for thou didst form my inward parts. You did weave me in my mother's womb. Notice what it says. You formed my inward parts. Who formed your inward parts? God did, not you, not the, not the male, not the female. It says, you did form my inward parts, God. You did weave me in the womb. And when David says, you have formed my inward parts, you did weave me in my mother's womb, don't, don't, don't misunderstand that. You have to understand what he's saying. He's talking about the physical body. He's not talking about the soul as of yet. In other words, God does work. God does the work in the building of the physical body and then when the physical body or the fetus is ready it comes forth from the womb and God breathes into that physical body what the Hebrew calls neshuma back here neshuma the breath of life and now that becomes a person so when the fetus comes forth from the womb that's when God can give that fetus neshuma the breath of life all of a sudden it's now alive now was it alive inside of the mother's womb absolutely but it was biological life it was an extension of the mother's life and this is not condoning abortion it just simply says that when you come forth from the womb that's when you really become a person now let me ask you a question was, was uh, Jesus Christ God? Was he God? Of course he was. Okay. Was he inside of his mother's womb? When did Jesus Christ say that God had been his God? He said, you have been my God when? Since something happened. What was it? Go back to Psalm 22.10. I want you to see this because it's vital. 
The, bo the body is a fantastic thing that God has created to give us a life. And in Psalm 22.10, I want you to see that Jesus Christ does not say that God had been his God from when he was inside his mother's womb. He doesn't say that. In fact, if you have a concordance, you want to do a check, just keep on looking up the phrase from the womb. Notice what Jesus Christ says, upon thee, who's he talking to? God. I was cast from when? From what? Why does it say conception? It says what? Birth. Upon thee, I was cast from birth. You have been my God in my mother's womb? Does it say that? Come on. No, it says, you've been my God from my mother's womb. In other words, when the fetus comes forth, that is now alive. It is now a person. That's why you can't tell a person who may have had an abortion in some cases. I mean, many times it's wrong, but if they have an abortion, you still can't call them a murderer because it's not a person. It's not soul life until it comes forth from the womb. There's a lot of teaching on this. I'm not going to get distracted. I want you to just understand this principle, and I've got more teaching on it. Life begins when the fetus emerges from the womb. That's when you became a person. That's when Jesus Christ said, you now have been my God since my mother's womb. Life begins when the fetus emerges from the womb, and then God gives to that fetus, Neshuma, the spark of life, not developed in the womb, but it's given by God at birth, at birth. And therefore, that's why the, bo the body is a fantastic thing. And that's what Moses is going to teach the people as to why they should go forward in God's plan and what, why they have been created. Now, go back to Psalm 139. <clears throat> You'll see how all this applies as we continue to go forward. Psalm 139 again. Verse 13, you did form me, you did form my inward parts. Yes, God did. He did all the work in your, inside of your body. Your body is a precious vessel created by God. It should be esteemed. It should be honored. It should be taken care of. You didst form my inward parts. Thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen me from, seen my unformed substance. In other words, God knew you before you were even a, a fetus. God knew you before that. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book, they were all written. The days were all ordained for me. God ordained every single one. We will die after the days that God has ordained are completed. The days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. Oh, how precious also are thy thoughts to me, O oh God. How vast is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. The point I want you to see is that there are certain situations that God brings people out and God brings people to to drive them to him. But he wants you to understand why it is that he desires you because he created you ever since you were formed in your mother's womb. Again, I say the word drive because the tragic thing is that most of the time we take the Lord for granted and we forget where we came from. And where, not only where we came from and what we are really like without him. The Jews are going to learn, this is what you're like without me. You need to wake up and realize that. You need to wake up and realize what you are or what you were without me. You need to be reminded. In fact, the Apostle John, in the last book written in the Word of God, the book of Revelation, go to it, chapter 2. He told the church of Ephesus something very, very similar. Something that more than Psalm 139 applies to us. Revelation 2, verse 1. What happened at the church of Ephesus? Well, notice what it says. To the angel, the word angel is angelos, it means messenger, it refers to the pastor teacher. To the pastor teacher of the church in Ephesus, write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. 
the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, that's on the omniscience there, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance. I know that you cannot endure evil men. I know you put to test those who call themselves apostles and they are not, and you found them to be false. I know you have perseverance. You don't quit like a lot of God's people do, even in doctrinal ministries. You have perseverance. You have endured for my name's sake. You have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have left what? Your first what? Your first love. Remember when you first became born again and saved? I mean, really experienced the fact that you were saved, how exciting it was. You were like so pumped up. You, I mean, everything centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. Here they left their first love. A lot of believers end up in this principle. What are we supposed to do if that's true? Look at verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Remember where you, what you were without him. And repent. Change your mind. Do the deeds that you did at first. You were excited about God's word. You wouldn't miss a Bible class. You loved the word of God. If it was something that hit you in the face or hit you between the eyes, you accepted it. If it was something that was gracious, you loved it. If it was something that would reprove you, you actually said, I want it. And he says, remember from where you have fallen and change your mind. Go do the deeds you did at first when you first were excited about really becoming saved or else I am coming to you. Here's where we have divine discipline, the sin unto death, and I will remove your lampstand out of its place. You will no longer shine unless you what? What does it say? Unless you what? Come on now, I don't hear you guys this evening. I missed you now. Let me hear your voice. Unless you what? Repent. You change your mind. Never forget where you came from and what you were like before God reached out to you. Or as Revelation 2.5 says, and a good verse to remember, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Sometimes it's good to remember where we came from and what we were like before our Lord reached out to us. Always remember, you did not go searching for God. John 15.16, you did not choose me. But I chose who? I chose you. I appointed you that you should go, not sit down in your gluteus masochist and bear fruit, that you should go forth and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Let me prove what happened to the Jews and why they fell away and why God led them to the waters of bitterness and what he's going to do about the waters of bitterness. I'll give you a little hint. He's going to have Moses throw in a tree, a tree that is sweet, and it's going to change the bitter water the bitter situation into something fantastic, as we're going to note in just a moment. But let me show you what happened to the Jews. Go back to Psalm 107, verse 4. They wandered all over the desert, as you know, and they, they still were not accepting the God, even though he had performed all these miracles. They were rejecting the God, the men of God God placed over him. And in, over them, in Psalm 107, 4, they wandered in the wilderness and in the desert region. They did, not, they did not find a way to an inhabited city. They didn't know where they were going. In fact, they actually walked in one square mile. Most theologians will tell you, one square mile for 40 years. They kept walking around, running around, and around. Why? God was dealing with them. They were not ready to have their own city in their own place as of yet. They were still filled with bitterness, jealousy, anger, critical, being very uh, judgmental. And so God kept on saying, you're going to stay out here until you learn the lesson. So they were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Notice they're complaining their soul is fainting. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. What did he do? He delivered them out of their distress. Why? He's faithful. He led them also by a straight way to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his love and kindness, grace, and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. There were those who dwelt in the darkness, in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, even though they were free. They were in more bondage out and being in freedom in the desert than they were back in Egypt. Because they had rebelled, here's why they were in bondage, because they had rebelled against the word of what? 
the word of God. They spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he humbled their heart, their heart with labor. They stumbled, and there was none to help. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them. Once again, he's faithful and just. He saved them out of their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death. He broke their bands apart. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has shattered gates of the gates of he has shattered gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Notice they've afflicted themselves. Why? Because of their rebellious way. Their soul abhorred all kinds of food. And they drew near to the gates of death. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distress. He sent his word. Here it is again. And the word healed them. It's the only way you're ever going to be truly healed. He delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks. That's what they were not doing. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, thanking God, telling of his works with joyful singing. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens. They went down to the depths. They went up and up down. Their soul melted away in their misery. They killed themselves with negative attitude. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And what did he do? He brought them out of their, what? Distress. You see, that's what they should, see, that's why God leads you and he leads all of us to places of bitterness, to places where we are tested because of jealousy, because of anger. He will actually put us in a situation where we have to deal with the fact that we are either positive or negative, and he's going to keep on doing that till we pass the test. That's why the dumbest sheep in the world are those who have to keep on taking the same test over and over and over and over again until they finally learn. Now go back to our main passage, Exodus 15. I want to show you how, um, how God actually turned a situation of bitterness and, uh, to a situation of relaxation, love, and grace. Verse 25, then he cried out to the Lord, Notice what, what our Lord did. He cried out to the Lord and notice what, what our Lord did. And the Lord showed him a tree or a piece of wood and he threw it into the waters. And the water, and he is not the Lord, it's Moses. Moses threw it into the waters and the waters now became sweet. What kind of waters were these? They were bitter waters. Now what are they? They're sweet. There he made for them a statute and regulation, and there he tested them. Now, notice that, that it doesn't say how he picked up it, but that you must remember that the uh, Lord did not do this. Moses did. He picked up a tree. You have to remember, I told you before, one of the manifestations of the life of Moses is he was a very, very powerful man. So look at it again. It says, the Lord showed Moses a tree. He threw it. Moses threw the tree into the waters, and the waters became sweet. The bitter waters have now become drinkable. The bitter situation is now something that you can handle. What is that? That's Romans 8.28, when all things can work together for those who what? Love God, whether it's a situation of bitterness or whether it's a situation of prosperity. Whether it's in anger, it doesn't matter. No matter what the situation is, if you love him, he's going to turn it into a blessing. Deuteronomy 23.5, that's the curse, turned into the blessing. The bitter waters now become a blessing. Genesis 50, verse 20, what Satan meant for evil, God turns it into what? He turns it into good. In other words, whatever it was, it was not Moses who did this, who did something. You see, he did not do this on his own. He did it because of the fact that he was in fellowship with God and he derived his power from God. There was no secret ingredient in the tree uh, which made the water sweet, not at all. What was, it, what was it that made the water sweet? It was a man called Moses who followed the commands of God, interceded for the people of God through a tree, which you know that represents, the cross, threw it into the bitter waters, and now the bitter situation becomes something that is sweet. Something that you can say, you know what, it's not that bad. I'm glad I went through that. I had an opportunity to glorify God. I'm still here. I didn't quit. 
I kept going forward in the plan of God, like a lot of people have now. You'd be shocked the kind of people that have quit our ministry, and I was thinking in 2016, now a couple in 2017, but uh, it's amazing. It's amazing how people just simply throw in the towel instead of saying there's got to be a reason why God has placed me in this situation. Watch your heart because once your heart becomes bitter and filled with anger and jealousy and negativity and being critical, not only does it hurt you, but remember what Hebrews 12.15 says? Hebrews actually, uh, Hebrews 12.15, bitterness defiles many once a person is bitter, he passes that bitter around, bitterness around, someone's got to stop it. So what was it that turned the bitter situation into a sweet one? It was Moses' obedience to the Lord's commands. The Lord says, I want you to get that uh, tree, throw it in the water. What do I have to pick up a tree for? The water's bitter. What do you want me to do, clean up the, clean up the land? So... I'll follow the commands of God. I'm going to throw that tree in the water. Moses was a genius. He didn't argue with the Lord. He didn't say, it doesn't make sense. Just like a lot of times we hear something from the word of God, you may say, that doesn't make sense. I don't think I should do that. But if it's obedience to the word of God, you're always going to prosper. Notice once again, God used another miracle with this people because the tree or the wood represents what we call the divine solution. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Our Lord was nailed to a what? To a tree. The tree, or the wood, wood represents the humanity of Christ. That's the only part of the Lord you can kill. You can't kill his deity. But the tree or the wood represents then the divine solution. There's always, listen to me, no matter what you are going through, no matter what you are facing, no matter what you're going to face, no matter what, whatever you think is, is terrible in your life, there is always a divine solution. A human solution is no solution. A divine solution is why God led you to those bitter waters. The wood actually depicts the doctrines and the promises of God. But the wood itself is actually meaningless right now. It, it, it was what Moses did right now. It's not that the Lord was going to die. Moses just had fellowship with the Lord. The, the, he hasn't died yet. The wood just, just simply pointed to the fact that it represented what God was going to do in the future. And Moses said, I'm going to obey my God no matter what. It was what Moses did. He obeyed the word of God. Today the Lord speaks to us in the same way, doesn't he? In a different way, by the way. He doesn't speak to us through, through wood, but through his what? The word. That's what he wants. The point is, however, is that Moses was a one-man pivot who could pick up the shield of faith under pressure. Are you? Suppose 2017, God's going to lead you to a bitter situation. And you're going to have to ask yourself, what am I going to do in this bitter situation? Run away? Complain? Murmur? Blame Moses? Or wait for the divine solution? God would not bring me to this place because he wants to hurt me. We're evil. We, good, we, do, we give good things to our children. How much more shall our Heavenly Father give good things to us? Look unto Christ, the author, the finisher of your faith. faith. Don't let situations of bitterness destroy you. Stay, on, stay in them and let God show you or give you the divine solution. So the tree represents to us the promises from God. That's why what we have, what was the first tree ever mentioned in the word of God? The tree of life. What is the tree of life? Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 3.18. She, the tree of life, will be something for the uh, people of God that will inspire them, that will give them the courage to go forward and not complain and not murmur and not blame anyone whatsoever. So the tree represents to us the promises from God, doctrinal rationales. What do I mean by that? You have to ask yourself, why would God do this to me if he loves me? There must be something good in this for me, or God would not lead me to these bitter waters. And therefore, it also represents what we call a divine command. And by the way, a divine command that seemed to have nothing to do with the solution, but had everything to do with the solution. It didn't seem, how is throwing a tree into the bitter waters going to solve my problem? Does it make sense? No. But you have to have faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. 
Without that faith, you cannot please him. That's the divine solution. The tree also, also has something to do with what we call a branch. It's a picture of the branch, the Lord Jesus Christ. In every tree, there's a branch. Jesus Christ was on that branch. He was on that divine solution. And just as the tree was cast into the bitter water, making it sweet, so the Lord Jesus Christ heals the bitterness in those who invite his presence if you say to God, I'm going to stay in this situation, I'm not going to murmur, I'm not going to complain, I'm going to deal with the fact that you've led me here, and I'm not going to get bitter, and I'm going to wait for the divine solution that will not get me in bondage to bitterness. A lot of people are in bondage to bitterness, in bondage to anger, in bondage to jealousy, in bondage to gossip, in bondage to maligning, in bondage to sin in itself, always being critical never waiting for the sweetness of the word of God to solve their problem, and therefore, and thereby, glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. So Moses goes on and still has a congregation. He does, it didn't change the fact that the congregation changed. Moses goes on. He still has a congregation, and the majority are judging him. So let's go back and close in Exodus 15, 26. I want you to see what Moses said to the people. Well, this is going to get good, what's coming up, because now we're going to see the story unfolding where God actually leads uh, uh, all the people, well, leads Moses to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. And while he's up in the mountain for a few days and he's away from the people of God, what do they do? They stop building an idol. They, out of all the gold that they took out of Egypt, or may I say, they stole out of Egypt. And they're going to make an idol, and they'll all be partying. And Moses is going to go up, and he's going to get those Ten Commandments. He can't wait to get back down to see his people to show them, I've got the word of God. I've got what God wants us to do. They are in my hands. And he walks down the hill. Oh, my God. He looks around. He can't believe what he's seeing. People are dancing and yelling and screaming and hollering, and they're building the golden calf and bowing down. You know what Moses does? He takes the Ten Commandments and breaks them, all ten. Very, very frustrated, wouldn't you be? Sure, I would. So notice what Moses says except to the people of God after the waters become sweet. Verse 26, he said, listen, if you will give earnest heed to the voice, the word of God, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right, you can't just listen to the word of God, you have to apply it. If you do what is right and give ear to his commandments, his doctrines, keep all his statutes, that doesn't mean you're never going to sin, it means you follow them. He said, the Lord says, I will put none of the diseases on you, which you saw, that I put on the Egyptians. For I, the Lord, am your, what? Healer. Now look at verse 27. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water. Number 12 is very vital. We'll see more of that coming up on Friday. They came to the waters of uh, the 12, uh, the, uh, they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water, and 70, 70 date comes, and they camped there beside the waters. Now remember what we really have here. Remember, there's no chapter break in the original Word of God. So we have chapter 15 and 16, but that's not found in the Word of God. Actually, uh, the next verse, 16.1, is a continuation of 15.27. So in the original language, don't miss that because it stops you from the context. But once again, I want you to see God's grace to them, giving them the sweet water. Once again, no sooner are they the beneficiary, beneficiaries of God's grace, what do they do? They're going to complain. They're going to be critical. They are filled with the emotional sins. They haven't grown spiritually. You're not going to solve any of your problems in life until you grow spiritually. Some of you think that all they have to do is pray. Prayer is not a problem-solving device. If you want to solve your problems spiritually or if you want to solve your problems in the natural realm, the most important thing to do is to love them. Because if you don't, the Bible says you're under a curse 1 Corinthians 16, 22, until he comes back. That's how you solve your problems. This was one of the worst periods, by the way, in all of history, as far as believers are concerned. And at this time, they were the beneficiaries of God's grace in a fantastic way. 
But before we go on in Exodus 16, we need to just review a little bit, a, a little bit of what we call the faithfulness of God. I think about maybe I have what 10 minutes. I'll give you a few principles. First of all, these uh, the faithfulness of God is going to be based upon two principles. Go to Psalm 78:38. 78:38. And 107.20 is going to be the two verses that apply to the Jews at this time. Verse 78 says, But he, being compassionate, he forgave their iniquity. Notice, he, this is talking about the children of God in the desert. The very congregation that we've been studying with Moses is the very congregation that is in view in Psalm 78.38. He, being compassionate, once again, the compassion of God, forgave their iniquity. He did not destroy them, and often he restrained his anger, his own anger he had to restrain. He did not arouse all his wrath. Even God had to have patience with this congregation. That's the first uh, passage. Psalm 107.20 says this. This is how we solve the problem. Same, uh, same uh, congregation in view. He sent his word, and what did the word do? It healed them. He delivered them from their destructions. What made God do that? God is what? Faithful. They were faithless. Just because we're faithless, that doesn't mean that he's not faithful. He can take those bit, that bit of situation. See, you can do two things when you have bitter waters. You can run away from it and blame people for the bitterness, or you can say, I'm gonna stay here and wait for the divine solution. And trust me, the divine solution is going to be sweet. It's going to be something that you've enjoyed. It's going to be an increase in your spiritual life. And you're going to experience as never before more joy, more peace, more love, more gentleness, more self-control. Why? You stood in the situation. You stood and stayed, like we would say, in the gap with Moses. Because at this time, there you go, at this time Moses is about to have individuals begin to join him. Why? Because they stood in the gap. They became faithful. You see, faithfulness, number one is the definition of it. Faithfulness is the consistency, consistency and the stability of God. It means that God is always consistent. He does not change, but he's also stable. So while people are freaking out in the bitter water situation, God is right there with Moses, being consistent and being stable. Faithfulness is the perfection of God's essence. In other words, it really re reveals the essence of God and the fact that he cannot be inconsistent or compromise his essence. He says, I love you. I'm a God of love, and I'm a God of faithfulness. It's a part of what we call the doctrine of divine essence. And that means that God never changes, no matter what the situation may be. And you may be complaining at the bitter waters, but God's still going to be there for you, being faithful and consistent, because though we are faithless, he is still faithful. Faithfulness, therefore, reveals that God is consistent with himself. Therefore, he is faithful and consistent with us. It's who and what God is. God does not change. We do. God keeps his word. Never, God never made a promise that he did not keep and never will do so. There's only one person, by the way, who will always be totally faithful to you, and that is not a member of the human race. Well, you, yes, Jesus Christ, we could say that, but the real one that's faithful to us is God and God alone. He can only be faithful to you because that's who and what he is. You can't be something than who and what you are. God is faithful. Divine faithfulness is his, his grace, his compassion, expressing itself to believers who are in a jam, who are in trouble. You got some trouble this evening. Are you in a jam? Do you feel like you're being bitter? Do you feel, uh, bitter? Do you feel like bitterness is beginning to control your life or jealousy or anger? Stick with the plan. Stay right where you are. Let God come through for you because he always will. Look at Lamentations chapter 3, and this, I believe, will be our last passage. Verse 21. Faithfulness always hinges on the essence of God because God is perfect. He's fair, and he's stable to himself. 
And therefore, he, will only, he can only be perfect and fair and stable with you. He cannot change, Hebrews 13, 8. But Lamentations 3, verse 20. Lamentations is uh, right near the book of Jeremiah, right before it, I believe. Or is it after? After. Lamentations 3, verse 20. Surely, Jeremiah writes, and by the way, Jeremiah writes this when, remember we studied Psalm 119? And all the people that were in the chain gang and they were being taken captive to Babylon, but not Jeremiah because God always protects his people even when the people are under divine judgment. Jeremiah is on the top of a mountain when he writes this, looking down at his, all his family members, his children, uh, his, no, probably not his children, and all, all the people that he loved and he grew up with members of his own uh, tribe. And he's looking down as he sees all of them being abused. Young people, uh, uh, middle-aged people, old people were killed, young, young people, babies were killed as well. They took maybe from age uh, 10 to, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60, I don't know what the age is, but they, the middle people. And he looks down, he sees all these people in, in chains marching before him. And what does he say in verse 20? Surely my soul remembers and is humbled within me. He recalls what, the, what kind of fun they used to have when they were growing in God's grace and knowledge. Surely my soul remembers in Limitations 3.20 and is humbled within me. This doctrine I recall to my mind and because I recall this doctrine to my mind, I have confidence. The Lord's grace support the Lord's grace support. This is the grace support, especially when you're in fellowship with him. It never what? It never ceases. By the way, even the people that are being taken in bondage are, going, are under the principle of grace because that's their bitter waters that they're about to face. The Lord's grace support. This is not the same crowd as Moses had, by the way. This is a different one. The Lord's grace support never ceases. His grace expressions never fail. They are new every what? Every morning, great is your faithfulness. Not great is our faithfulness or my faithfulness, but great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have confidence in him. The Lord, once again, is good to those who wait for him, to the person who, pre who actually seeks for him. Always remember, he's always there for us even in the places of bitter waters, where he can turn the bitter water into an expression of sweetness because he, we throw in or he throws in the word of God, the wood, reminding us of the humanity of Christ and the fact that someday he would die for us. We look back at the cross, they had to look forward to it. But thank God we have a God who always can take those situations, no matter how bad it is that you're going through, always remember there's someone that's got it worse than you. Just like there's someone that has it better than you. We all have to realize that we are children of God. God wants to change our lives. God wants us to enjoy the principles that he has given us throughout his word. And the only way we can do that is to continue to go forward in his plan. Well, thank you for being here this evening. Once again, let us pray. Father, we ask your blessing now to be upon the remainder of this evening. Thank you for those who have taken their time to come out and join us as we continue our study in your word. Bless us as we continue to go forward in your plan. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we do pray. Amen. Amen.